Hi again guys, so let's continue with this thing. We're going to be covering today the different type of loads and if I'm going to start the lesson like I always start my lectures or my meetings, I say define load. What is the definition for load? <laughs> Think about that. If I ask you that right now, what would you answer? What is the, type, what is the definition of load? Well, for our realm, once again, those loads are when, when we talk about loads, we refer to all the forces applied to a particular structure. And when I talk about loads, I might be referring also to moments. So not only forces, but forces and moments, etc., 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 applied to a structure or acting on a, a particular type of a structure. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So the most important type of loads are, tell me, the roof. Well, yeah, but this is not the type of load. The beams. Yeah, okay, gear this, but this is not the type of load. <coughs> that type of load is referred as dead load. And what is dead load? Dead load are gravity type of loads uh, and refers to the self weight of the elements and everything that is attached to the structure. For example, pipes, air conditioning system, water tanks, coverings, roofs, ducts, everything that is permanently attached to the structure, walls, if the walls are not movable, and they are going to be there during the life of the structure, those are called uh, dead loads. Those are really, uh, that type of load is really the most known type of load because we just need to know basically the weight of the materials and if we know the weight of the materials, the density, the weight, and we know uh, the volume, we know the shape, then we can perfectly determine that load with a certain very good accuracy. We can do that. There are tables for that that tells you every one of the loads, what is, uh, for example, how much is the weight of the aluminum per cubic feet? Then if you know the area, the cross-sectional area or the volume, then you can calculate the load because of that. For example, you have this floor beam here in this figure. It's just to support six feet width of a lightweight plain concrete slab having a thickness. You start reading that and, and, and you have to read it the first time completely and then you have to start picking up clues of what you have here. So basically what we have to do is calculate the weight of this beam, that's it, on this beam produced by this structure that is on top of that. Okay, so what components are being supported here? First, it says lightweight plain concrete slab, six feet. Oh, this is the lightweight plain concrete slab over there. And then you have the thickness of that slab also here. Now the slab serves up a portion of a ceiling and therefore the bottom is coated with plaster. So you have to include the plaster here, the weight of the plaster. And then you have a eight foot tall, 12 inch thick, lightweight solid concrete block wall here on top of that. This is a linear load as you can see. And it's directly on top flange of the beam, determine the total uh, the loading on the beam measured per foot of the length of the beam. That's what we have to do. Good. So first, lightweight plain concrete. So we come here, we have tables, and in that table we look for lightweight concrete, plain, per inch, per inch. Look at that, per inch. So this is a weight of 8 pounds per square foot per inch. Now in this case we have 4 inches, that means that we have to multiply that 8 pounds per square foot per inch per 4 inches, that will be how much a square foot, and because we are required to express this in linear foot, then we have to multiply that by the width, and that will give us that whole slab weighs 192 pounds per linear foot now in this direction. Good, that's easy, you see? It's not complicated. Now, coated with plaster. Okay, let's look for plaster. Ceilings, 
plaster on tile or concrete five pounds per square foot now once again that five pounds per square foot has to be multiplied by six now that six if you realize is including also the width of the slab is that of the beam and we are not plastering that underneath right so we are not plastering this part so why are we including it refinement is good but this is a little bit too much if we discount that area for the plaster because no matter what when you may, maybe you are plastering the bottom of the I don't know but that refinement I don't know if you know what I'm saying right that should be six feet minus whatever the the width of this is now there are occasions that you're gonna discount that when it's representative but usually that dimension is very small so you don't discount that when you calculate that and you are in the safe side second lightweight or oh, third lightweight solid concrete block okay I don't have anything here right but in the other table or other tables we have here a masonry lightweight solid concrete okay this is says here pounds per cubic feet now we have to convert that into linear once again now I have 12 inches here which means one feet and then I have eight feet here so if I multiply that by one feet and by eight feet I should get it in linear foot this one feet is this 12 inches here now we have that and um, the total amount is one when you add this plus this plus this you get 1062 pounds per foot it's simple right anything that we are missing well we are missing the self weight of the steel beam because that's also carried by the beam now we don't have that information but uh, and usually you don't have it at first when you are estimating loads so what you do then you add an estimated 50 pounds per foot 80 pounds per foot depending on the length depending on the span but you have to estimate something if you don't once you do the estimation and you calculate the beam then you have to go back include the value and then redesign again or reanalyze again the project but always remember the self weight of the elements have to be carried by the elements so you have to include that now there's another type of load which is called live load what are live loads well if dead loads are those loads that are permanently attached to the structure then that means a live load may move but not only that they can also change intensity they can be in the same the same spot but changing intensity and that's considered a live load so they are also gravity loads but they can change position and or intensity or value now they are empirical what do you mean by that they are based on the statistics and because of that they are really conservative now uh, let's say that you are designing an, a classroom how, how do you know what is the life load in that classroom do you think that you're gonna go and wait every single student that goes into that classroom of course not uh, and that load by the way is changing not only in location because one the students can move from one side to the other side but they can also change completely because there's gonna be some times that you're not gonna have that load and there are gonna be some times that you're gonna have full load in that in that uh, classroom so instead of uh, assigning a particular weight for a particular student what you do is that you uh, these loads are based on occupancy depending on the use of the structure depending on the use of that particular room then there are certain the, the, the specification or codes uh, uh, provides you with a certain amount of loads now because you don't know the values and you have more uncertainty associated with this type of load that's what it makes it more conservative because it better say than sorry so usually when you go and you study this type of loads you're gonna see the values are really 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 big and then it says should be positioned to give the maximum effect 
partial alternate full span. Uh, what I mean by that is, let me let me switch this to this part here. Yeah. So let's say that you are designing a classroom building, and then you have something like this. This is a frame in that classroom, and you are designing, let's say here in this part, the first story, right there. And then it happens that you go and you find the loads in the specification, which I'm going to show you now, the values for the loads. And this is, I don't know, 40 pounds per square foot of loads. And they are prescribed usually as a rectangular load. So how do you put the load over there? Logically, the more the merrier. In this case, I put the load everywhere. And you're right, but that's only one of the possible scenarios because what would happen if instead of the load being placed there, now the load is only placed here? Or instead of only placed here, it's placed here and here. Now this type of situation, when you have load in two adjacent, uh, two spans like that, when you do the moment diagram, that's going to produce a bigger, a bigger a negative moment in the center span. This type of load is going to produce a more symmetric approach of the moment distribution. And even worse, both of them are symmetric. But let's say that you have another one here. And then you do what I told you to do. You only put load in one side. When this load is going to produce, a drifting in the structure. The structure is going to slide because the loads are not symmetric then. So that's why when you when you position the load, the life load in particular, you have to take every single possibility for that load into account. And then you take the worst case scenario produced by all of them, and then you design with that for positive and for negative. If it's moment that you're looking for, for positive moment and for negative moment. And one way that you can do this, especially in bridges, are with uh, influence lines, which is one of the main topics of this class. But just for now and on, just keep in mind that it's not only determining the type of load, it's positioning the type of load that is important. Now, that value is a lot. And it's the, the values are so conservative that even the, the ASCE code or specification allows for a reduction. And we're going to learn how to do that reduction. Also, why, 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 why could we even be interested in reducing the live load? Well, because reducing the live load makes the smaller elements, makes the smaller loads, makes cheaper structures, and they are still safe structures. That's basically why. And we're going to be talking about live load reduction in a future video. Um, but this is basically the way it's calculated. This is the original live load. And these are uh, the tributary area. The tributary area. And this is just a factor depending on what member you are trying to, to reduce the live load on. And depending if they're interior columns or interior uh, beams or edge or if they are multi-story elements, etc., etc., etc. Look at the loads. Hotel guest rooms, 40 pounds per square foot. Now, if you analyze how much is 40 pounds per square foot, I always, I always say something like that. I don't know. Uh, let's say that instead of a square foot, let's talk about square yard. Let's say one yard by one yard. That means how many? Three by three, nine. Nine of those. Nine times four, 360. 360 pounds in one space like that everywhere. 360 pounds are two of me hugging each other in that area everywhere. That would be awesome, two of me right over there everywhere. But that's not real. That's not realistic. You're never going to have that type of load. That's why the same ASCE 7 allows you for a reduction in that load, among other things. And you can have different types of, uh, look at that, lobbies, 100 pounds per square foot. That's crazy. 
That's crazy, 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 crazy. So, but anyway, we're going to learn how to reduce those loads if we need to reduce those loads. And there are certain, a lot of things that apply, and we're going to do an example on that. Now, another type of loads are highway live loads dealing with cars, vehicles, and trucks. The, in the United States, the ASHTO, what means ASHTO? American Association of State, Way Hi State Highway and Transportation Officials. And that load has been standardized, standardized as uh, the HL93 load, among other loads. But the HL93 is the main highway load and that is produced by a combination of several factors and those combinations are lane load of 640 pounds per linear foot and then you have a tandem load of 25 kip separated by uh, this distance which is 4 feet uh, or the HS20 usually HS2044 vehicle which is 64 kip 72 kip 64 plus 8 72 kip load uh, in this distribution and what this load does basically is that uh, once again uh, the first combination is the lane load 640 pounds per square per linear foot as I show here and the vehicle the HS20 vehicle that's one case that you do on a study then you have the other case the second case is using the tandem load which is this one tandem load and the linear uh, the lane load and you use this one also and then you do a third combination and the third combination is two vehicles place a uh, the lane load always stay and the lane loads accounts per per uh, cars not moving for example okay when the cars are stationed there um, and these are two vehicles in adjacent spans side to side because when you do that the negative moment here is going to be also increased and that accounts for maximum negative moments over there. So you do that. Once again, consider all the cases, get the worst, worst case scenario for each one of them, create an envelope, and with that envelope is that you design. Now you have impact loads, and impact loads are usually loads that are uh, crashing, or that are hitting, or that are oscillating in the structure. The, and that accounts for the dynamic effects. And this is just here to show you uh, the representation of if you have a spring. This is the tip. This is the, the the rationale behind this. If you have a mass hanging from the spring, you get the formation X. But if you get the mass hanging from that spring and you let it go, you might get a maximum uh, vibration of two times, or you can get the effect when it's here of two times the value of the load. So yes, they have to be taken into account. Uh, for this, uh, for this load. How do the specifications and codes deal with the impact load? They just increase the live load by a percentage. Um, basically, that's what they do. Usually, it's about 20% the increase, but there are cases that is more than 20%, depending on, on the importance of what you are doing, like always. All the type of loads, look at that. Snow loads, of course, not here in Florida. But yes, snow loads are very important. Uh, how do you uh, uh, account for snow loads? You, depending on the type of load, this is the this is the type of load that you're using here, and you just multiply an exposure factor that depends on where the construction is located at, and the. You see, if it's in the center of a city, which is shelter, is bigger than is uh, fully exposed, because it's gonna be it's gonna be windy here. It's gonna be reduced than if it's shelter, and then you have another coefficient, which is the thermal factor. Also, depending if the construction is heated or not heated, that's gonna also increase that. And then you have the importance factor, which always generates impact in the students. Um, the, the less important the structure is, the impact factor is smaller. And that's not because you don't take into account the lives. It's just totally the opposite. Uh, you want, especially those structures that uh, agglomerate a lot of people, they have to be safer. And the first responders 
have to be also safer because those are the ones that are going to be the type of structures that should be on facilities standing if anything happens. And this value here is just the density of the, the snow in the ground as is. And then you calculate that and then you place the loads in the structure, etc., etc., etc. This is really simple procedure to do. Then you have wind load, which is also simple but not as simple. Now everybody thinks of wind load, oh, the wind is pushing the structure and that's it. But that's only part of that. But if you look at that, then you have this part, which is called the windward side, and this is the leeward side. In the windward side, yes, the, the wind, if the wind comes from this direction, is pushing the structure, as you can see here. But when it goes around and in the other direction, it sucks the structure, it's pulling it in that, which is even worse because it pushes it in this side and it pulls in the other side. Now regarding the roof, it could also go like trying to lift the structure or it could be also trying to push this part down and this part up. What do you do? Like always, compute for every single possibility and take the worst case scenario from all of them. That's what you do. And how do you calculate that? Well, then you have this equation here, which is, it looks very complicated, but it's not that complicated. It's just a bunch of coefficients that you have to pull with different tables and different charts. And that's basically it. This factor accounts for the density of the air, unit conversion. This call here is exposure coefficient. This is a, co this is a, depending on the topographic coefficient, depending where you are uh, located at. This depends on the type of structure that you have, the shape, the geometry, this is the speed of the wind. And as I say here, it's a three second gust wind speed at a height of 33 feet, uh, one of 50 chance exceeding any year. So one occurrence is every, uh, two occurrences uh, every 100 year. So that's basically what it's, it says here. And how do you determine the speed of the wind? You don't put an, 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 an a wind measurement device over there, uh, an anemometer. You don't put it there. Uh, what you do is that uh, you have maps generated and created with historical data, and those maps are outdated, uh, updated, and then you can have the wind speed, for example, here, you see, the different type of wind speeds in kilometers per hour, in miles per hour, uh, depending on what scale you are reading, uh, in different locations. Now you have earthquake loads. The earthquake load is basically the same thing. Uh, we don't have earthquakes here in Florida. We might receive some, but more to the north. And you know what happened here, right? Basically, you have a structure. The structure is not going to move. The structure is fixed, but the ground is moving. When the ground is moving, the structure has to stay, the, when the load of inertia has to try to stay in the same place. But because the ground is moving, then the structure moves, try to move and balance that thing. And when the ground is here, the structure has to go to the other side. And that's what produces that balancing movement over there. So what is the procedure for dealing with these loads? There are several procedures. There is a static equivalent analysis. There are dynamic analysis. Um, but basically, this is what happened, you know? You have the type of a structure like that. The ground moves, and the structure starts moving, and it might collapse in that case. How do we treat this? We treat this in several ways. But if you use the static analysis, for example, what we do is that we account that ground motion and this displacement are produced by forces. And we determine those forces per level and apply those forces to the structure. And those structures is gonna give you the base shear, which is the total. Basically what we do is we compute this base shear and distribute it through the ground. And this is in the static analysis. The dynamic analysis is a little bit more complex, but it's fairly similar. So if we want to do this, the first step is calculating the base shear, and the base shear is calculated in this way. You have between a maximum and a minimum values. When you check this one here, W is the total dead load of the building. So we can calculate that. Uh, no live load, dead load only. T is the fundamental period, national period of the building also. 
and we can calculate that with several uh, equations. Now R is called the response uh, amplification factor and that depends on the type of frames that you have to prevent the, the movement, the sideways movement. For example, if you have a ductile steel or concrete frame with rigid joints, okay, the amplification factor is eight. Uh, if you have shear walls, it's four because they are more effective. Or if you have a reinforced masonry, shear walls are two. Depending on that, that factor over there is going to be here, depending on what you're doing. Uh, what else, what else, what else, what else? Uh, then the SDS is called the, the spectrum design. Now, the fundamental period is calculated uh, with this is an empirical formula also, and depends on the multiplication of these, uh, these factors, CT, and that CT is just a factor that accounts for the type of a structure that we have, and multiplied by HN to the X. X is an empirical coefficient, and HN is the average roof height above ground. And also you can use this one here. But this one is even more conservative than that one over there. Then you have the SDS and the SD1. As I said before, the SD1 is a factor computed using the seismic maps. In the same way that I showed you before, the, the wind maps, there are seismic maps over there. And then you have the SD1 accounts for one second, and then the SDS accounts for the short period here. And you use both of them. You can read those values. Now there are tables that provide those values also for different cities. You don't have to do the whole analysis. But if you do the whole analysis, you have to go get maps, get into charts, and calculate those values. That's basically it. Now, we already have SD1. We already have W. We have T. We have R. And then we have the impact factor, the occupancy impact factor. Everything is uh, defined in the specifications and depends on the type of the structure, the use of the structure, where the structure is going to be located at. And these factors also depend on the geology of the site. And at the end, once I calculate that V, we calculate that V over there, what we do is that we distribute that V in the different floors. How do we do that? Uh, this value here is the dead weight of the floor at the levels I and X. What does that mean? That means that WI, which is this one, is every single floor. This is the total amount of weight multiplied by the, 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 the height from the base to the floor squared, uh, not squared, to the K value. So we add all of those, and then we distribute that just with our base shear floor by floor. That's it. This is, if we are in the first floor, the second floor, that will be W2H2 here to the K all the time. And that's what we do. And once we have that, what we do is that apply those forces over there that kind of follow a linear distribution, kind of. There are other things that we have to consider, that is the torsion, depending on the irregularity of the plans, the floor plans, uh, if the, the center of gravity of that plant doesn't, which is where the force should be applied, or is going to be applied, doesn't coincide with the center of torsion, or the shear center of that one, you're going to have a torsion in the structure that is going to cost additional. But this is not an earthquake engineering class. I just put this here for you to have a slightly idea on how to deal with that. Because usually when people say seismic design, earthquake, I'm from <laughs> I'm from California, not from Florida. We don't have earthquakes. Uh, we have earthquakes. Yeah, well, this is a procedure for earthquakes. We don't have earthquakes. We have hurricanes that we also have to follow a procedure similar to that. So everything is similar. Everything has the specifications, and thanks God, the specification provides you the guidance and all the elements that you need to do a good design. Now, you have another type of laws, for example, tsunamis. Yeah, yeah, of course, tsunamis. The, wor the, the water comes here, inundates, produce a flood in the building here, 
and then it goes back. So you have a bunch of things mixing here. You have a hydrostatic effect. Why? Because when the water has a thin depth, that is producing a push on the walls and a push in this way also. Water or soil, those are hydrostatic. But you have the hydrodynamic effect also, which accounts for the movement of the water when it goes in one direction and when it goes in the other direction. And once again, it's a bunch of coefficients which are explained very well in the specifications and it's usually the same thing. And now you have the debris impact loads also that you have to take into account because when, when you have that mass of water slash mud slash debris moving, that's going to be impacting the building. And then you have to take several cases and take into account several cases. And when the water inundates, then depending, you can get flooding inside the building. And then you have to include that weight also, which at the end, everything is going to translate into these lateral loads. That's what you do all the time. And that's the way you analyze it, that. Once again, a little bit more of effort and planning into calculating those loads, but everything is laid out in the specifications and codes. Now, ponding of water on flat roofs. That's a problem. When you have flat roofs, what happens is that if the drainage is clogged somehow, then you're going to have water accumulation, which is a little bit more than the water filtrating to the structure, is uh, the weight of the water. Because what happened is that when you p you have the water on top of that, that is start adding some force, some weight to that structure, which is creating a bowl shape. Um, when as, as the deflection increases, then you have more bowl capacity to hold more water. And if it keeps raining, then you're going to have more deflection. And if that deflection creates more bowl capacity and the water keeps accumulating, more deflection, and so on, until it collapses. I don't know if it's going to collapse, but it's a very, very important load. And a lot of people don't take that into account. Um, that's what I'm referring to, for example. And this is an small structure and look what happened. Now the specifications also, this is from AIS, uh, AISC specification, but they account also the, the for that type of loads. Just keep in mind, yeah, there are specifications and we have to take that into account. That's it. Now you have construction loads. Once again, the ASCE in this case, you have a full specification only dedicated to construction loads. What are those loads? Plenty of them. For example, when you the, the, you are taking an element from one side to the other side, like this truss here, for example, that truss is not is not a originally intended. The, the original design is not to be erected into the place. The original intended uh, design is for receiving load from the top to the bottom. So, but then you somehow when you are erecting that structure or erecting that bridge, you have to take those loads into account in the design of the load. Not only design that structure for the normal loads, normal, quote, quote unquote, normal, uh, that they are going to work in their service life, but also for that type of temporary construction loads are going to be applied to them and during the process. You can have uh, structures that work uh, for example, you have this beam here, this girder, and that girder at first, when you are putting everything together, that girder is receiving the weight of everything plus the weight of the girder. But once the structure is connected, if it is connected, and if it's intended to work like that, it creates a composite section. And that composite section is going to have a completely different properties than the girder itself and the slab itself. Those are loads that have to be taken into account also. You have equipment moving through the zone when you are building or retrofitting or doing something. That is important. You can have accumulation. 
and because the scaffolding here fail or the temporary shoring fail in this part and you can have accumulation of people and accumulation of concrete for example or accumulation of materials in a particular site all of that type of laws are included here but just keep in mind that those loads exist also. Other type of load, thermal loads, especially for indeterminate structures. You remember uh, in mechanics of materials, solid mechanics, you should study some type of thermal loading like that. And that's why you see like expansion joints in, in bridges. Then you have blast loads. There are certain structures that have to be uh, calculated by blast loads. Why? Because mm, they might be, I don't know, the control room in a refinery, uh, all the instrumentation is there and there's a highly possibility of an explosion there, well then those are blast zones over there. There are other type of mechanisms that can be used like a blast wall for example, but those are specifications also for that. Now you have compaction loads especially if you have a dynamic compaction like that one going on there you have a building and then you're going to be compacting a lot close by that building that compaction is going to be felt by this uh, structure so those are other type of loads that could also exist and that's what do you do with all those loads now with all those loads what you do is that now you design those loads and you mix those loads in certain way that depends on the philosophies of the site. I was planning on keeping that in the same lecture, but no, I'm going to do a new video and we're going to be talking about philosophies of design soon. See you later, alligator. Keep watching.